Spring is one of my favorite seasons of the year. Part of the reason is because I can come out and enjoy the sunshine, not have to wear my winter coat, but it also is a time of year when plants and animals reappear and become much more active. When we are out walking in nature in the spring, we can use our ears to hear bird sounds. We can use our nose to smell beautiful flowers. We can use our sight to be able to see all the beautiful things as we're walking. So I'm going to go on a spring adventure and I'm hoping that you'll come with me. What are you waiting for? Come on! I'm so excited! I can hear my first American toad call of the year in the spring. They're a little bit late this year because it's been a cool spring, but they are now just starting to come out and call for their mates. It's a very hard to call to uh, mimic but it's a very throaty, bubbly sound. You'll hear, you can hear them in the background. The males are all calling, hoping that the females will come by and mate with them so that they can lay eggs. All right, so I spotted a beautiful frog in this little pond area. I'm gonna see if I can catch it with my net. Oh! Got it. He is. So this is a beautiful green frog and green frogs come in many different colors. This one is a beautiful, you can see almost an emerald green with black spots, but there are green frogs that are black, there are green frogs that are almost brown, um, and they might even have a different pattern on its back. The really interesting thing about the green frog and other frogs as well is this very large circle you see right behind its ear and that is a tympanic membrane, which is like its ear. And so it uses that to be able to hear other frogs calling um, and to be able to hear frogs that are calling that want to mate. He has very slimy skin and that helps protect him in the water, but he also breathes partly through his skin. So we have to be careful not to touch him if we have sunscreen or insect repellent on our hands because that can go through into his body. And he has these beautiful jumping legs. And this one I can tell is a male because it has this beautiful yellow throat. The uh, females don't have quite that color. It's more, it's a, a little bit of a creamy color. So, and he also has that really large eardrum. So those are two reasons that we can tell it's a male. And there's those beautiful legs, super powerful and beautiful webbed toes to allow it to swim really well through the water. I'm not gonna keep him out of the water for too long because we want to make sure that his skin doesn't dry out and uh, keep him safe. So I've managed to find one of my favorite amphibians. It's a red-backed salamander. So because he's an amphibian, he has slimy skin, just like frogs, and he does not have lungs, which is very interesting. They actually have to breathe through their skin, so they always have to stay moist. And so I actually don't handle salamanders for very long because if they dry out, they won't be able to breathe anymore because he has those four beautiful legs and beautiful long tail. And you can see where he gets his name with that lovely orange stripe down his back. There's also another phase, color phase of the red back salamander and it's called the lead phase and it's just basically gray. It does not have the red stripe. They lay eggs in the middle of the summer, June and July, and most of the, pla the only place you would really find a salamander is under a rock or a log because as I said they have to keep their skin moist at all times. So I just did some dip netting and I managed to find a very cool creature. This is a crayfish and it is a crustacean. So it has lots of pairs of legs, more legs than an insect does. And of course it has those front claws that it uses to try and protect itself. I'm currently holding the crayfish the correct way. You basically have to hold them under their armpits and that way they can't reach around and pinch you with their pinchers. And they have a really interesting way of moving in the water. They actually swim backwards and they flip their tail and they can move actually quite quickly through the water. I found this one hiding in some moss in a little uh, area here in the waters to protect itself from predators eating it. He's pretty neat. Um, 
monogamous, which means they find a mate and they mate for life with that with that other Canada goose. And so when it's spring, they're looking for nesting areas and they might have fights with other geese over territory. Maybe they find a nice spot and they want to protect it their area from other geese coming. So you might hear lots of honking in the background. That's the, them making sure they get the perfect spot to make their nest. A nest might be um, a small hollow in the ground. It might be even on top of some re reeds near a, near a pond. Even they've been sometimes seen on top of beaver, beaver lodges, which is kind of a neat way up high so that they're protected from predators. So keep an ear out, see if you can hear those geese talking to each other. One of the first signs of spring is when the plants start to come out of the ground. And the very first plants that come out of the ground are called ephemerals. It's a big word. It means transitory or quickly fading. And an ephemeral plant is one that comes out during the time when the trees have not had their leaves come out yet so that they can be able to use all the resources of sun and nutrients in the soil before all the other plants come out. Now these plants will sprout, bloom, reproduce, and die off all before the leaves on the trees come out. And so we're gonna be looking at a bunch of ephemerals today and try to identify what they are. So here's an ephemeral you might recognize. Of course, it's the trillium and it's Ontario's provincial flower. What's really interesting about the trillium is there's some different colors of trilliums. We have this beautiful purple trillium here. We have a white trillium and there's a pinkish colored one as well. So the purple flower, actually has a distinct smell to it that smells like rotting flesh and has a color that looks like that. I'm gonna test this one out and see how it smells. Oh, that's awful. It has a terrible smell to it. <laughs> how they're different is what pollinates them. Flies and beetles like to pollinate it, whereas the white flowers have a much sweeter smell and attract bees and wasps. But here's the really interesting thing about trilliums. They depend on ants to help move their seeds around. Their seeds have something called an eliosome on them. It's a pulpy part of the seed, and ants love eliosomes. They carry the seeds back to their colony. They feed the eliosomes to their larvae, their little baby ants, and the seed is not affected by that. Then the, when the eliosome is gone, the seed is discarded in the ant garbage pile, and that garbage pile has dead ants and ant poop, which is lots of nutrients that allows that seed to germinate. So the ants have allowed the trillium to be able to move the seeds from one place to another, even though the trillium obviously can't move and is rooted to the ground. So here we have one of my favorite ephemeral plants. It's called a trout lily. And it's called a trout lily because the pattern on the leaves looks a bit like a brook trout, has the same pattern. And the trout lily has this beautiful yellow flower. It's kind of shaped like a bell when it comes out. So the interesting thing about trout lilies is if you see them across the forest floor, the young plants will only have one leaf that will come up. And the older plants that are a year, maybe two years, will have more than one leaf and they will flower. So they can take one to two years to actually produce a flower. There are colonies that we think could be as old as the trees in the forest that they're living in. So sometimes 200 to 300 years old. So I found one of my other favorite spring plants. I know I have a lot of favorites. This is called wild ginger. So wild ginger has this beautiful heart shaped leaf that you can see. And here it has a really interesting looking flower. And the flower is at the base of the stem, which is kind of a strange place for a flower. But it's there for a reason because beetles and ants actually are what pollinate this flower. And they obviously would have a harder time crawling up to the top of, of a plant to get to the flower. So their flowers are often lower to the ground so that they can crawl inside. And you'll also no notice this color is almost like a, a dead animal in color. And so the, the beetles and the ants are attracted to that and they will go inside and they will try and see if there's food in there and then they will inadvertently pollinate the wild ginger. So one of the things you often hear in the spring are bird calls and it's one of my favorite things to go out into nature and listen to. And there is a difference between a bird call and a bird song. Calls tend to be shorter and are used for alarm or to keep in contact with other members of the bird family. 
it, whereas songs are more for courtship and mating. So in the spring, we hear lots and lots of bird songs. The interesting thing about bird songs is that scientists have taken some of them and have made them into little songs that can help us remember or little patterns that we can remember. And one of them is a song sparrow, which call which call sounds like somebody singing, maids, 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 put on your tea kettle. That's one of my favorite ones. Or the red-winged blackbird, which is one of the very first birds to return from, from migration in the spring. And there sounds like ogre glee, ogre glee. So when you're out walking in nature, listen for those bird songs. There's even apps you can get on your phone that can help you identify those calls. And you can see who might be calling in the background and looking for their mates. So when people go on a nature walk, they often are excited to try and find animals. But animals aren't always very cooperative, and we don't always see them exactly when we want them to. So one thing you can look for that you will always find if you're out on a nature walk are something called worm middens. And so these are little piles of plant debris that a worm will put over top of their worm hole. And so what they do is they collect all of these little leaves and little sticks, they pull them over top of their little burrow that's in the soil, and they keep them there for a couple reasons, to protect them from the sun, to protect them from predators, and to give themselves a nice candy food source because they do eat leaves and debris that's on the forest floor. The other reason they put the debris on top of their hole is because eventually it will start to decompose and the nutrients will go down into the burrow and will be an extra food source for the worm. So if I carefully lift one of these piles of debris up, we will see there's a lovely little hole right there and there is a worm that's down inside there and he's staying nice and dry and cozy and protected from predators with this little pile of debris he's got on top of him. So the next time you go for a nature walk, work for these little piles of debris as you walk through the forest and chances are there's a worm underneath. So I've managed to find a little earthworm in the ground and earthworms we know are very, very important for the all of the living things in um, in a forest. They aerate the soil by making tunnels in the soil, which brings more oxygen in. They um, mix up the subsoil and the topsoil together to move the nutrients around. Their poop has lots of nutrients for the plants to be able to grow. And they secrete a slime on their body that has lots of nitrogen in it, which is also a, a very important ingredient that plants need to be able to grow. So earthworms are our friends in the forest. So on behalf of everyone at Scientists in School, I'd like to really thank you for joining me on my spring adventure today. I found all kinds of signs of spring on my walk and I'm hoping that you will go outside and look for signs of spring near you. Don't forget you can download our spring guide on our website at www.scientistinschool.ca or you can find it right here on our YouTube channel, just below the description. So don't forget to stay curious and keep exploring. See you next time.